Excellent. I hate when people clap before I talk. It sets the bar too high. <laughs> Um, but thank you for that. So yeah, history of water quality. So I will get into a little bit of nutrients. Um, but there are other issues that we uh, face on a, on a daily basis, on an annual basis in this great lake that's behind you. And so I'm going to give you kind of just a, a look into some of the issues that, uh, that Ohio's juggling and, and, and that Lake Erie is dealing with, because I know a lot of you are not necessarily from, from this location. Um, but I will spend a lot of time talking about nutrients and where those nutrients are coming from and in what form and, and things like that. So you will get a glimpse of, of that. And then I know you'll hear a lot about, I've looked at all the sessions that you will be in today. So that's where you'll get into the weeds on some of these things. I'm going to be on that 30,000 foot view for you. Uh, let's get to the logos though. So uh, I wear two hats. I'm the director of what's called a Sea Grant program. So that's the logo you're seeing in the bottom right. I'm, Ohio Sea Grant is one of 34 programs. So every state that bumps into the Atlantic, Pacific, the Gulf, or one of the Great Lakes has a Sea Grant program, and it is NOAA funded. So that's that logo on the left-hand side. So a little bit more than a third of my annual operating budget comes from the federal government, from NOAA. Um, then another third of the budget comes from the Ohio State University because they own that island campus that is across the, 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 the lake here a little bit. Um, and so the research, education, and outreach with that is integrated with Ohio State, but specifically, you get to meet our dean, but specifically, I fall within the College of Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. Some stats for you. So four states, Border Lake Erie, and of course, two countries. And I can say, I won't mention a lot throughout the rest of the talk, but we work hand in hand with uh, the Canadian researchers on the northern shore of that lake. Uh, drinking water for about 11 million people um, fluctuates a little bit here and there, but for the most part, direct source of drinking water. So there are intake pipes in the lake that draw water in and that's treated and then consumed. 20 power plants pull water from this lake. Those numbers are coming down a little bit. Some of those are being decommissioned and closed, um, but there's a picture of one that's uh, fairly close to us here um, is one of those. And that is the greatest water use. I know when you move to other parts of the country, ag tends to be one of the larger water consumers for us. Um, it is this power generation power. 300 marinas, and this is just in the Ohio waters of Lake Erie. So this isn't the Canadian side. This isn't the other three states. A lot of marinas. Um, we tout ourselves as the walleye capital of the world. I don't know who gave us that title, but I keep repeating it. Um, <laughs> but you're close to uh, Port Clinton, which is just west of us. And, and there's the little walleye cart that they roll out um, every year for a walleye festival. But it is about a $1.5 billion sport fishing industry. Um, in, in Lake Erie. So when I drive up this time of year, when I go up to the islands, I'm seeing plates from Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, North Carolina. They're, they're coming here. They're coming here to catch some beautiful walleye. 40% um, of all Great Lakes, that's not Lake Erie, of all five Great Lakes, 40% of the charter captain businesses are in Lake Erie. Even though Lake Erie is only 2% of all the water in the five Great Lakes, it has about 50% of the fish where Lake Superior has about 50% of the water of all the Great Lakes, and it has only about 2% of the fish. So the nutrients that we have in this lake do produce algae, but that algae then feeds little tiny bugs, and those bugs feed tiny fish, and those tiny fish feed some honking walleyes, right? <laughs> and so the problem is, as we go to do these nutrient reduction discussions, as we lower those nutrients, we're doing that to get away from a cyanobacteria, so a harmful algal bloom. But we want Lake Erie still to be green. <laughs> we just want it to be a different kind of green and at a different time of year and one that isn't producing toxins. So it's a, it's a tough balance. And then coastal tourism, $15 billion in the eight counties that bump into Lake Erie. There are 88 counties in Ohio. So almost 30% of all tourism revenue for the state of Ohio comes from eight of 88 counties. And Lake Erie is our jewel and people love, love to come visit. So now the sad part, right? <laughs> Um, so this is clearly a case study in, in ecosystem kind of degradation, you might argue destruction, and then a good example of recovery. Um, we're struggling a little bit right now, but we had a pretty um, difficult past. You can see this is the Cuyahoga River, so that large um, uh, freighter coming through the Cuyahoga River. I don't know if I would ever get enough money paid to me to take that turn in a 700-foot vessel, uh, but nonetheless, there was a tremendous industry along the shores of the Cuyahoga we accomplished setting water on fire, right? That's awesome. The Burning River, Cleveland, right? Never a good sign when water catches on fire. So we're um, coming back. Hot, Mike. Um, coming back from that. But this happened, uh, there was a fire in, in 1969. And so with that, then it really stimulated what I would say is a good recovery. 
Um, we are actually famous in Dr. Seuss's Lorax. If you haven't read it before, it talks about these humming fish and how they're um, moving away from Lake Erie um, and talking about how the, the, the condition in the, the book, the Lorax, aren't as bad as it is in Lake Erie. So that's awesome to have that in our history. Um, but there is some recovery here. I think what I'll do with, are we okay here or do you want me to be at the podium? What would you prefer? <laughs> just get the I got that off. lesson already. Yeah. I only have to be taught once that one. Yeah, I'm just throwing that's a little painful. lanyard off. Well, that's funny. 69 was the one that caused this whole effort. How do I look? I don't want to pull the lanyard off your head. So uh, Different pose? I can do different weird. things. Okay. <laughs> You're this not on fun. camera, so it's okay. That's Everybody's right. just hearing this. If I so. pass out because I'm choked, come CPR, <laughs> compressions, breaths, compressions, <laughs> breaths. Um, so 69 was when it actually was the last time it burned. But everybody blames that. It had actually burnt, I think, 11 or 12 times previous to that. So basically, the industry, you had oil coming out from the industry. You had you know, debris in the river. And whenever you get a spark, the oil went, and then the debris went, and it, and it went. I mean, we burnt down major bridges that crossed over the Cuyahoga River that they caught on fire and just went. Let's go to the good side, right? And then we'll go to the back side, and then we'll go to the good side again. It's going to be a roller coaster ride. It's going to be great. Um, so because of this in 69, basically, we had the establishment of the EPA in the 70s. And then we also had the establishment of Earth Day. So that first Earth Day was in 1970. And then for those of you who are familiar with the Clean Water Act, that happened in 1972. So this was kind of that straw that broke the camel's back that really pushed us into some of this great environmental um, space. Um, so unfortunately, with this good story, EPA, Earth Day, Clean Water Act, we still have some persistent problems, and I'll run through some of those um, today. Some of them I'll go through quickly because I do want to get to the nutrient discussion. Um, I do want to mention that we are doing everything as we manage these large lakes in this part of the country. We're doing this land and river and lake management through a different lens. And what I'm showing you here, and you'll, I think you'll hear some of you from Aaron Wilson later, who comes um, from OSU and he's our climatologist. But what I'm showing you here is basically this is data from 1900 to roughly present day. Um, and it's not temperatures like we're at two degrees, but this is deviation from an average. So they took the average temp from 51 to 80, and that's what zero is. And then they plot every temperature relative to that deviation. And what you can see in this part of the country, this is for the Great Lakes, we are seeing a, a two degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature. Put it Fahrenheit here. If I was in an academic community, it'd be Celsius, but you guys are spared. We'll go in Fahrenheit, right? Um, but also we're seeing that the average winter temperatures are going higher and higher and higher. So we have higher temperatures that we should be expecting in the Great Lakes region on average. Summer surface water temperatures are up even more. So the water is warming faster than the air temps. And the way that I'm illustrating that for you here is this is percent ice cover. So we go out and measure what percentage of the five Great Lakes are covered in ice every year. And usually the running average through time is about 53% of the surface area is covered in ice. That's this. But you can see all of this low ice coverage that we've had now since basically the late 1990s into the 2000s. So we've had some very, very low ice years. There is variability. That's the nature of the beast we're living in here too, but that's a little glimpse into that. And then precipitation, again, you'll get more of this from Aaron Wilson later, but I just want to show you, again, same thing. We're taking the average precipitation measurement from 51 to 80. That's the zero line. And what we're showing is what is the precipitation departure since 1900 to roughly present day. And basically what we can say, we're about up 11% from that long-term average. Again, the period from 51 to from 80. And then this figure, basically, if you can't read the font, this is intense storms. So this is percent change in the amount of the one, the top 1% rain events, like those big downpours. And you can see everywhere the circles are large and red, that is a, an increase in the number and the prevalence of those um, large, large rain events. I'm going to skip over this for time for right now. So what you're seeing here is this is the basically western and centralish parts of Lake Erie. So this polygon, we call this a heat map. So basically what we're doing, wherever you see red colors is high algal bloom density. The greens and blues are low density and black is non-detect. And I put this slide up to tell you that the number one issue that, that my team is working on, the team is working on, um, is HABs. We probably spend 85% of our time in the HABs critical issue space. The other ones I'll touch on we're working in, but not as, as, as aggressively and intensely as here. But what I'll show you here is some of these blooms, 2015, 2011, 2015 being the worst on record. These are huge blooms. You stand at the shoreline here and look across, you will not be able to see Canada, right? But that water between where you are and where you can't see is an entire bloom in 2015. These are huge masses of green water, okay? So I'll get to this, but I wanna quickly go through the other issues and then I'll come back and we'll just dive into the nutrients associated with this issue. So we have a sediment dredging issue. Okay, so we have, we have 
soils and sediment leaving our fields, and they are clogging up the eight navigable channels in Ohio. So we have eight streams that have ports that have large vessels that come in. And when the sediment comes down, if you don't dredge those out, you don't have a functioning port. Um, in the Maumee River, which is Toledo, so just 30 miles west of us, they pull out 750 cubic kilometers of sediment annually. <laughs> annually, they are in there dredging. Okay, what are we going to do with this? We cannot dispose this in the open lake anymore. That regulation has passed for us. And so we got to find a use for it. And I think there is a great place for ag use. And so what you're seeing here is a, a moving of a, basically a slurry of that sediment. You will dewater. And then we are doing some testing in different facilities along Lake Erie to see if we can grow crops on those. Um, just to show you how big this is, basically Great Lakes, the circle size is basically how much sediments are pulled out of there. So you can see the Maumee River Toledo just dwarfs the other great navigable channels across the Great Lakes. But good things. I mean, this is the Toledo. So 55% of all the dredge in Lake Erie, Ohio Lake Erie is the most, but these are the other seven navigable streams. So annually, basically 1.5 million cubic yards um, are, are pulled out of there um, annually. Uh, this is where we're looking for it. So with the, uh, the Ohio EPA and others, we're trying to figure out what can we use this for, for agriculture, construction, engineering, can we develop products out of this? And can we do some wetland restoration with this material? So it's a really exciting time to be in that dredge um, and sediment space. This is a, a basically a, they dump the dredge in one area of this and the water slowly trickles down through this maze and then the sediment drops out as it goes and then they harvest from that material. And you can see it's right next to Cleveland. Aquatic invasive species is our other one. Um, I've got four different rivers listed here because when everybody hears about this fellow right here, this uh, a big head carp, they always talk about it being in the Mississippi River and it's likely gonna get into the Great Lakes or we're worried about it getting in the Great Lakes through the sanitary canal in Illinois. But in Ohio, we have four direct routes. If we don't even think about the sanitary canal in Chicago, there are four ways that that carp can get from the Mississippi drainage into the Great Lakes. I'm happy to report our DNR has identified all of these and is addressing them. I think three of them are actually shut down now. That hydrologic connection, I think they're working on the fourth. Um, but we have things like zebra mussels and quagga mussels. Um, there is a tie of this back to nutrients and how those nutrients sit in Lake Erie and how those might impact blooms. And so we're doing a lot of research in that space. And this is just another invasive, it's called a bithotrephes. Um, and basically it's an aquatic um, organism that is too big for our, our larval fish to eat but yet it's eating the food of those larval fish. So we're looking at this density and how it's impacting fish growth in the, in the lake. Carp details. So when people say this, they used to call it Asian carp. We're trying to get away from that terminology because it's not one fish, it's four. So these are the four species that are moving up the, the Mississippi, the big head, silver, black, and grass carp. For the big and silver, which ones are the ones that we're most worried about? The silver is the one that jumps, if you've seen videos about that. But they average about 40 pounds. We've seen fish up to greater than 100 pounds. Um, they can eat juveniles, so uh, small ones, can eat 120% of their body weight per day. Right? We've all done this. Thanksgiving, right? We just, we just had thing. We, we know how this is. Every day they get to have Thanksgiving is what's going on here. Uh, but they do harvest these out of the Mississippi and some of the, the tributaries of the Mississippi. So I know that greater than 25,000 pounds are caught by commercial fishers in the Illinois River annually. So it's a big, it's a big fish and it's a big problem. Next one I want to talk to you about is dead zone. So what the dead zone is for us is basically... Um, we lose oxygen at the bottom of the lake. So again, here's a, a map of Lake Erie. What now I have in this heat map is as you see these warm colors, that means there's lots of oxygen at the bottom and the cool colors means it's gone. <clears throat> and so what happens in Lake Erie is during the course of the year, organisms living in that lake will draw down that oxygen. Things like bacteria living on the bottom, decomposing algae, decomposing you know, dead and rotten fish and things like that will draw the oxygen out. If we look back through historic time, this dead zone, this large swath of, of area that has no oxygen is dramatically bigger than it was in, in the 70s and, and, and 80s. And so we have to figure out why that oxygen loss is happening because it results in fish kills. <clears throat> what we want to see actually is these two nasty pictures, but this is a positive sign. These are what are called mayflies. They live in the bottom sediments. And if there's oxygen at the bottom, you have a good hatch. And so we want to see in the spring, all of our cars covered with bugs because it means the bottom of Lake Erie is actually really, really healthy. <laughs> this mayfly is also great food for our walleye and yellow perch. So that's a good sign too. Uh, water levels are fluctuating like mad for us. Um, this is, you can't see it. Basically, this is 2021 to roughly present day. This is where the water levels are now. This is the cone of probability going forward into you know, summer and fall of, of this year. These are record highs. This is the long-term running average, and these are record lows. So we are sustained and high with water in Lake Erie, um, and it ties back to a lot of that um, 
spring rain events and the size of those spring rain events that we're starting to see. And this is not only on the U.S. side, this is some erosion on the U.S. side, but this is also in the Canadian side too. So we're not the only ones battling with erosion because of high water levels. These are our vessels up at the island in 2014. So you can see here's the dock sitting right about where that rub rail is. This is in 2014. This is what it was in the mid 60s, right? So you can't step on that rub rail. You need a ladder to get down in that vessel. And then in 2019, that's the problem we're facing. Okay, and sometimes in, in 2019 was the worst, 2020 was pretty bad too. We were like almost, almost 30 inches above the long-term running average. Last one I'll mention before we go back to HABs is contaminants. And so we're dealing with this in two ways. Uh, one is our historic contaminants. We're still trying to figure out how to treat and remove the PCBs that were released back in the industrial phases. And so in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So PCBs and others, that's a short list, but we have historic contaminants in the setting. But now we have emerging contaminants. We are seeing pharmaceuticals and personal care projects, PPCPs, pharmaceuticals and personal care products. If you go out to a stream now in Ohio, there's a good chance you're going to test that water, find nicotine, caffeine, antidepressants in that water. They're in, right? And so what we've got to do is figure out how to get those things out when we treat that water for consumption. And we've got to figure out what they're doing to the fish that don't have any water treatment before they're being exposed. Uh, we have PFFSAs, microplastics are all over the place. I just saw an article about a week ago that we're finding it in lung tissue. We are finding microplastic in human lung tissue. So let's switch gears and let's go back to HABs here. So I want to talk to you about how we got to this space. So basically you can see an increase in these blooms since the early 2000s. Um, the severity, it varies from year to year to year, and I'll talk about why that is. But what we found out is that we need a 40% reduction basically in the dissolved reactive phosphorus coming into the Western Basin of Lake Erie. And we think we can get these blooms to a size that would be typical. The organisms that are driving these aren't invasives. These are things that have been around for millions of years in the lake. So it's not like it's an invasive we're dealing with, it's just an excess of nutrients. So 40% is our target for the state um, in dissolved reactive phosphorus. So let's talk about the Great Lakes watershed. And I'll walk you through this graph, it's pretty complicated. But this land use, so it's all at 100. These are the five Great Lakes here. And then each color within here represents a land use. I'm gonna highlight that we're on here on the left, right? So we're gonna talk about Erie today because that's where the Maumee empties into. We are first in urban. So if you look at the number of people that live along the shorelines or in the watershed of these Great Lakes, we have the most. So as we talk about nutrient reduction, we sitting around the table cannot be removed from that discussion. We have wastewater treatment associated with people. We have home sewage treatment systems associated with those people. So if we're gonna cut nutrients by 40%, we have to do that too. Right? So this isn't always just an ag lens. This is also a urban and suburban lens too. As far as agriculture, we have the most agricultural in our watershed by percent. Okay? So we can't remove that activity on the landscape from the problem. Okay? So we're going to have nutrients from commercial fertilizers, but also from manure products. The gray bar is grasslands. It's pretty negligible, so I'll skip over that. But we have the least amount of forests. Um, you know, I, in a generality, our forests aren't typically leaking nutrient, our natural forests. Okay? There are some that will. Um, they'll have some, some nutrient loss, but typically they're not nutrient sources in our watershed. The last one, this dark blue is wetlands. And clearly you could look at how narrow that bar is. And I could say it's the least amount of wetlands of all five great lakes, but I actually put the number 10% up because it reminds me to tell you that we only have 10% of historic wetlands left around the Lake Erie. Okay. So we've gone in and we filled in those are drained for, for cities, but also for agricultural production that is needed. So I'm not saying we're going to put those 90% of wetlands back, but we know that that's got to be a tool in the toolbox to get some nutrient drawdown. And so how do we strategically place wetlands in places that they can do that service? Every time I show a graph, I try and show a picture just to get your brain to, to relax a little. So let's go from science to, to eye candy, right? So these are Canada geese uh, up by our island in 2011, second worst bloom on record. You can see the trail behind those geese. Um, this is a colleague of mine, Dr. Richard Krauss, with his family and friends out on the lake. You can see this bloom behind that vessel. So big blooms in size and in density. So where are the nutrients coming from today? The two biggest loaders for us in Lake Erie are the Maumee and Sandusky Rivers. Um, so those are where we're measuring phosphorus. That's where the most is coming from. If we drill down a little bit more, we know all the point sources. So the pipe contributions of phosphorus in those two rivers. So we subtract out those point sources. We know that in the Maumee, 87% of this phosphorus is coming from non-point. And then the Sandusky, it's 93 Okay, so a lot coming from non-point sources. Nitrogen is also 89% of the nitrogen is coming from the Maumee from non-point and 96 from the Sandusky. I bring up nitrogen because we cannot only talk about phosphorus if we're talking about blooms. We now know that nitrogen increases the size of those blooms, but it also is tied to their level of toxicity. 
If we want to cut down on not only bloom size, but how quickly they go toxic, we've got to know more about nitrogen and we've got to lower those numbers. Ag is dominant in these two watersheds, uh, greater than 70% of the land in the Maumee and Sandusky is ag. Not doing this to point finger at ag, what I'm telling you is if an urban, suburban, and ag acre gave the same amount of phosphorus into the system, just by the math, more in ag. It's not a finger pointing bullseye on your back. It is, if we're going to put efforts and resources into this problem, you got to think about where you're putting those resources. So not me calling out ag producers. We need it. You saw Dean Crest. It sustains life. We just got to figure out how we get those nutrients down. I do not want to get away from the early slides that I put in there for a very specific reason with climate change is because 70 to 90% of the loading happens 20% of the flows. So to boil this down even more, basically we know that basically 10 storm events are delivering the bulk of the phosphorus into the system. So yes, it's a phosphorus management issue. Yes, it's a nitrogen management issue, but it is a water management issue at the same time. So keep that in the back of your head and in your pocket. When you think about this, it's not an easy solution. We've got to come at this from many different approaches. So here's nutrient sources today, and I'm going to try and run through this uh, fairly quickly. But, you know, wastewater treatment plants, WWTPs, um, in the mid-70s when the Clean Water Act came in, we had to upgrade all these. So relative to the mid-70s, 75% reduction, only 9% of the, the water leaving the Maumee at the end can be tied back to these point sources. It doesn't mean wastewater treatment plants are off the hook, because if we're going to go a 40% reduction, then I'd like to see this 9% down to 5%, right? But it's, again, telling you where do we think about resources for this. CSOs, these are those combined sewer overflows. I'll go over this really quickly. There are about 62 in, in Ohio. 40 of those 62 um, have control plans now in place. Um, but if you add this all up, and I, again, I, I want to go through this quickly, but if you add this all up, all those CSOs that are reported, usually, to the EPA, um, it would only add up to about 1% at the mouth of the Maumee. I am not telling you we don't address CSOs because this is where our beach closures come from because of E. coli and pathogens and bacteria. So we need to address CSOs for that, but this is not driving blooms in Lake Erie. The next one is septic systems. On average, we think about 4% of the phosphorus at the end of the Maumee is coming from home sewage treatment systems. Now this varies across the, the state because the soils are different and, and which septic systems leak versus which don't varies. But I can tell you that the state, both EPA and, and, and health are working to address these um, fail, you know, failing septic systems. Uh, fertilizers from Scott's miracle Grow. we went in and looked into our suburban and urban lawns. Um, basically, Scott's removed phosphorus from its maintenance fertilizers, not its starter fertilizer, but its maintenance fertilizers. And so basically, we haven't had phosphorus in those fertilizers since 2013. Okay. And the last one I want to just talk about is internal loading. All this stuff I'm telling you right now is for Lake Erie proper. Um, and so I want to let you know that uh, basically what we know is that uh, the lake itself is not driving these blooms either. So the western part of this lake, Lake Erie, is fairly shallow as far as Great Lakes are concerned. So a lot of people were thinking for a while that it's these storms that come through that shake up those nutrients, and those nutrients then come to the surface and drive the blooms. We went out in one of our larger years in an intensive study and basically monitored the movement of the sediment and the nutrients from the bottom up into the water column. And of course, there's different techniques and different things to do, um, as with science. So the, the numbers from that study came back somewhere between 3 to 7% of the phosphorus that is tapped into by these blooms is coming from the lake itself. Okay, so if you add these up, wastewater treatment point sources, CSOs, septic, urban contributions, this internal contribution, it's coming back to you know, somewhere in that 80%, give or take, in an annual year is coming from that ag sector. I say this again, not to put you know, a bad light on ag. I'm just saying this is, this is where the numbers are coming from. And that's why when we see in Ohio, our governor put the H2 Ohio program out, a lot of that investment is going to ODA um, to help with those, um, those runoff events. I do want to end here with a little bit of a discussion on legacy phosphorus. And, and, and Dr. Greg Labarge is in the, in the room with us today, and he did a lot of this work with Laura Johnson for National, Qua uh, National Water Quality um, Research Center out of Heidelberg University. Complicated graph right now, but I'll walk you through the axes and what we're looking at here. But what I want to use this is to talk a little bit about um, the, the approaches we take to lowering to that 40% target. So what you're seeing is this is called particulate phosphorus. And that's why I put this here. This is filter paper. So you run your water sample through here and whatever gets stuck on this, you measure the phosphorus there and that's your particulate, okay? And so what we have here is time, um, basically to roughly present day. Every dot represents this particulate phosphorus during that time period that um, drives the blooms. So basically it's the nutrients coming from the 1st of March to the end of July drives these blooms. 
And so what we do through Heidelberg and other mechanisms is measure how much total particulate phosphorus comes from the 1st of March to the end of July. Okay, and what you can see, this black line is the running average. This gray line is our target. So if we wanna get 40%, we basically said that means the total phosphorus has to be at that gray line. So in the 70s, right, Clean Water Act, we, we, we get some of this addressed, it starts to drop, but I would argue that in the mid to early 2000s, we've kind of stabilized in time. Tremendous variability from year to year, but on that running average, we've kind of stabilized here, okay? What I'm now gonna add, oh, and this is, so in, this was in 2020, so that's where we were at the end of 2020 for that spring loading season, this is the target. So 0.23 milligrams per liter, and in 2020, we were double that. Let's move to dissolved phosphorus. So now, this is when you filter that water, the water that goes through, you measure the phosphorus that's dissolved in here. So same setup, it's gonna be dissolved phosphorus here on the axis, but it'll be time, and then each purple dot represents a given year. There it is, high in the 70s, Clean Water Act, lots of activity going on, this drops, and then we see this creep up, late 90s, early 2000s. Again, variability from year to year, but the running average is getting you still above that target line. In this case, for dissolve, it's 0 0.05 milligrams per liter. Okay, so, I think there's some promising stuff. Like, look at that, right? Those three last recent years look pretty darn good, right? So there's stuff there. But as a five-year running average, we are not at the target where we need to be, okay? Now, I will say here, and I, I'm so happy that Terry Mesher is here to speak for you next on H2 Ohio, but I'll tell you, we've invested a lot in this. But I, every time I have a chance to talk to an audience, that investment is great, but you will not see instant results on these. When you get those funds to an agency, it's not easy to get that from the agency to the farm, right? And it's also these things that we put in practice have some lag effect to them. When you put it there, it's not going to instantly draw down those nutrients. There is some lag here. And so we need to be, as I communicate this, and some of my colleagues do, we need to communicate that there is a lag effect in getting these nutrients to come down relative to the deployment of practice. Okay, so for me, when I, when I give this talk, I would say, all right, to reduce by 40%, I think about this in three buckets. And this is just the way I communicate it. I'm sure if I talk to other academics and many of you in the room, you might think about it through a different lens, but this is the way I go about it. The first bucket for me is what we call the 4R stewardship. Um, so this is right rate, right time, right place, right source, right? I think of this as our relationship as, a, as, as producers or ag in the fall before planting season in that spring. What decisions are you making in that, in that real time space? Okay, and so again, subsurface placement of both manure and commercials, it's cover crops, it's soil testing, it's variable rate technology, those sorts of things. I would argue the second thing is this legacy pool. Those four R's don't necessarily get at that phosphorus that's already there. And that's why I'm happy that Dean Kress talked about these edge of field bioabsorption technologies, that absorptive thing, because we have nutrients that are already in that system in these legacy fields and everybody defines legacy different. But in my context here, it's the stuff that you didn't apply in a, in a given growing season. And the last one, I don't want you to lose track of it, is uh, water management, okay? So these are the three things. We've got to do our current day for our kind of practices. We've got to do our things to address legacy. And then we've got to get after this water management because this variability you see from year to year, that isn't just because, hey, we did a lot of adoption of practices in, in this year and we did none in this year. This is often associated with a heavy rain event in that spring window moving those nutrients. So I wanna tell you a story about legacy here. And again, a lot of this comes back to Greg Labarge and Dr. Laura Johnson, they have a paper out on it. I, I'll get the link for you or I can get it from Greg and get it to um, Glenn Arnold. But we learned in, 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 in our opinion um, from the research that, that, that we have a, a little bit better idea of how much legacy is contributing. So what I'm showing you here, this is discharge out of the Maumee River, and this is bioavailable phosphorus. So this is that dissolved part. And then also some of that particulate is available for growth because those cyanobacteria can strip that phosphorus off of soil, right? So it's, it's a combination of the DRP, the dissolved, and the particulate. But anyway, what you can see here is, and scientists love to see this, is predictability. Every dot on here is a data point. So the the, the bioavailable phosphorus we measured at the Maumee River, at Waterville specifically, and we know how much water came down that river. And so all of these dots, if I went to my six and eight-year-old kid and said, draw me one line that represents those dots, that's pretty close to the line you'd draw, that, that hopefully they draw. I don't know, my son Elliot might be, you know, smiley face over here, I don't know what he would do. Um, but anyway, what it shows you is that most of those dots are on or very, very near to that line. So it gives you predictive ability. I can go out and say, all right, well, let's assume that this year we're gonna get four cubic kilometers of, of, of water coming down, slide up, hit this line, 
then I can estimate that this is probably the bioavailable phosphorus you would see. So in 2019, if I told you the discharge was this, which it was, we would expect it to be somewhere here, maybe not right on the line, but in that neighborhood. In 2019, it was actually here. So bioavailable phosphorus was approximately 24% lower than expected based on this model, this predictive model. So the question then was why? And so I'm gonna give you possible explanations for this. You know, a lot of work still going on in this and we're looking at this, but I wanna talk about why. And for Ohio, specifically Northwest Ohio, the fall of 18 was really wet and the spring of 19 was really wet. And because of that, you saw this. This is Maumee Watershed Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. So 2018, we're gonna call that a quote, quote unquote normal year. So in May, you know, brown, a little green out on the fields. Then in June, it gets darker green for growing crops. So on and forth through, through August. So this light brown to a dark green over that time period. If you look in 2019, look at this delayed green. 41% of land went unplanted in 2019. In 2018, it was only 5%. As far as typical commercial applications, only 46% of those amounts were actually sold in that year. And as far as manure, what we've heard, and, and Glenn probably has updated data on this, approximately 50% of the manure application went in in that March to May period. So what I would argue here is that 18 being wet, 19 being wet, forced more four R's in that 2019 growing season than normal. You couldn't get out there to put the fertilizer on because it was too wet, right? And so what it did was this was kind of a, a BMP four R deployment on steroids in the fall of 18 and into 19. And so what I'm saying is that I think this and, and some of the publication that Greg Labarge and others are associated with, some of this drop here is what we can get from really diving into that first bucket that your relationship with phosphorus in a given growing year. But the other two things that we didn't control in 2019 because of the rain was the legacy pool and the water management pool, the movement of those nutrients. And so this just is one of those reasons for me to kind of segue into this idea of legacy. And what I want to highlight, and I borrowed some of this from the US uh, DA, is that phosphorus transport to the lake is both a combination of the legacy P and what's listed here is contemporary, your annual relationship with that nutrient. Okay, so it's coming from both. There's a legacy component and a current application real-time loss. I'm worried that this legacy um, is gonna be a chronic source for decades. So even if we get 85% adoption of three practices across the watershed, you still have those slow leaking legacy fields that are over hundred parts per million or 150 parts per million. The other thing is this untreated legacy I'm worried about is gonna mask all the great work we're doing now. Right? We have anticipations that you know, Ohio, H2O Ohio is going to do a lot of stuff to lower those nutrients. It's a good investment in practices on the field, incentivizing farmers, working with farmers, working with researchers, working with state agencies. But I'm worried we're not going to see it fall or the public may not see it as fall as we want because we have this piece. And so it's my job, and hopefully you can carry this on, is to make sure people understand the complexities of this issue. And this is not a light switch we turn on and off overnight. And the last one I'll go into is effective P management strategies will depend on the phosphorus source. So on that field, we need to know, are we losing it mostly from legacy and where in the field is that legacy coming from? And if we're losing it from a contemporary application, where on that field might we be losing those nutrients? And so I'll, I'll basically say, I'll try and end here on a good note. Um, in 2015, when Toledo had its drinking water issue where we couldn't drink the water for 72 hours, um, EPA and the governor and others got together um, and decided that we needed to do some research to inform some of the practices and some of the approaches that we put in place to, to get to a 40% reduction. And so the Ohio Department of Higher Education funded what we call the HABS Research Initiative or HABRE. And basically we set out to do this. We needed to find ways to produce safe drinking water because if you got this bloom and it's producing toxins, we, we can't be drinking it. So a lot of research in that space. We gotta know if you do drink it, very little was done on the, on the impacts, the human impacts, the burdens to the human body with this exposure. So we did a lot of health, human health projects. We also wanna know how this bloom behave. When do they, that was crazy. That was not me. You good? Okay, let's start again, because I just wanna make sure. <laughs> I gotta tell my kids twice, so they're not gonna listen. So let's go, let's go again. <clears throat> this is the problem with too many slides. Like, you should know that. And the animation, all right, I'm learning so much about myself right now. This is horrible. Um, good, right there. Oh, good. Oh, nice stop. Um, so how blooms behave. We now know when they produce toxins, when they don't, because they have to have certain genes and those certain genes have to be turned on. We know when they're in the water column, when they're down in the water column, 
We know when they start likely blooming, when they start fading off. So we know a little bit more about the blooms. And now what we got to do is the heavy lift and what you're a part of today is how do we slow those nutrient runoffs into the systems? And how do we do it without, you know, negatively approaching each other and, you know, um, being angry and upset about these, these issues. And so um, every year I had the absolute pleasure of calling five state agencies. For me, it's EPA, DNR, health, ag, and what we call in Ohio, the Lake Erie Commission. It's a meeting of all the, the state agencies that have jurisdiction on Lake Erie themselves. And I have the absolute pleasure of going to them and saying, how can I help fund research that informs your management decisions? So every year I get a list of priorities. I'm going to throw them all up here um, real quickly. We don't have time to go through all of them, but I want you to know that the research we're funding is because the agencies would love to have this data so that they can make X and Y decision. Um, so ODNR is doing a lot, basically nutshell, they're working on wetlands. Ag has been so good. And you'll see here the number of priorities that they're providing right? How do we do manure management and application methods? How, what is the cost benefit of subsurface placement? It's easy for a bunch of academics to say, if you subsurface place it, you get less runoff. Okay. Who's buying the toolbar for me? My tractor's not big enough to pull the toolbar. So like, what are those decisions, right? Uh, climate change. We need to know when are we putting the things out on the field? How do we engage with these heavy rain events, those sorts of things? Um, and then you can see commission, they really want to do like modeling efforts. So H2 Ohio is moving forward. They're trying to assess what's going on under H2 Ohio. They're trying to fund pilot projects so we can, you know, outfit one with a bunch of BMPs and, and not touch the other sub watershed and see how they um, compare to each other. And then EPA and health for the most part are, they want to know to protect human life and, and, and they want the water treatment process and they want to know about health risks. These are the ones that are coming out of the Department of Ag. This is the list of 10. Um, the list right now is primarily seven. They do have two-stage ditches and edge of field stuff on the radar. I don't want to steal Terry Mushers. And then wetlands is the last of these top 10 BMPs. And this is work being done by the ODNR. So the wetlands are amazing. Um, and I'll stop there. Glenn, I know you, I think, time for some questions or what do you, what do you need? Good. All related to the presentation. I don't want any algebra stuff, no word problems, none of that stuff. Yes, please. All right. Uh, talking about breaking up materials, what kind of testing to ensure that those materials are safe for application to ag fields? Because you know, you talked about all the all the legacy bad old days before EPA and all the stuff we did in the lakes. All that stuff is still sitting in the sediment. So what are we doing about that before we put it on? Yeah, so, uh, so the question, if you couldn't hear from over there, so basically we're still dredging and we have a lot of those historic contaminants still on the bottom. Uh, for a while, for a long time, until basically 2020, we were putting them in the open lake. So most of those are probably already been picked up and they're out in the lake and they're probably covered in sediments or they've moved on. Before that ban on open lake disposal, so that sediment movement, we had to have the Army Corps and some state agencies and federal EPA were, were doing cores of sediments. And so those that still have contaminants that are of human health risks do have to be in upland containment facilities, but the other ones are tested and then they're determined what they can be used for. So the sediments are actually pretty clean um, as far as that's concerned. But that's a great question. Thank you. Glenn, which one do you want to run to? I can, I can repeat the questions. That works too. That works great. Why don't we come here and then I'm coming to you next, please. Yeah, just you know, color up on the dredging. So Oh, yeah. So the question is, with the sediment coming down, does that displace the water and increase the water levels? Yeah, no, relative to... So let me tell you this. In Lake Erie, most people see all these rivers around Lake Erie. About 90 to 94% of the water coming into Lake Erie comes from the Detroit River. It comes from Lake Superior, Michigan, and Huron down through us. So when we have a heavy rain event in like the Toledo area and the Maumee floods, um, it's really not changing the water level of Lake Erie drastically. What it is doing is bringing in those... The, the chemicals and the, you know, whether it's antibiotics or caffeine or whatever the heck it's carrying those down the waterway. Please back there. So the question is, is alum treatment or any kind of treatment to absorb phosphorus that's in the stream. So the problem is, is, is that, there's, so there's a lot of that work going on. And not only did H2O fund H2 Ohio's, I'm sorry, not only did the Ohio Department of Higher Education's HAB research initiative address a lot of those, 
but the Ohio EPA ran what was called a TAP program. It was the technology assessment program. So they recruited all these tech solutions of absorption and water treatment and those sorts of things. And they're evaluating theirs. And I think there's four or five projects that are getting extra funding to move forward. So I've seen so much in that space on technology. The problem is, even though the Maumee is small relative to the Detroit River, the Maumee is the largest tributary of all the Great Lakes, right? The Detroit's a connecting channel, so we don't really call it a river. It connects the upper Great Lakes to lower, but it is the largest tributary of all the Great Lakes. And so that volume of water is crazy, right? And so to put any kind of chemical in there, you'd be flying those like, you know, flame retardant jets over forest fires and dumping those chemicals in. And I'm sure people that live along the lake don't want to see that going on. So unfortunately for us, it, once it's in the lake, there, I don't see that technological silver bullet in here. The volume of water is massive. But for upland reservoirs, yeah, we could probably be absorbing that phosphorus and then the blooms don't happen in these upland reservoirs that then that community treats and has for drinking water. So I think on a small scale in local communities, those, those approaches are, are very valid. For the Western Basin of Lake Erie, ain't gonna happen. I think there was a question over here. Right now, where are you? So good. Where's the legacy phosphorus? Uh, and I kind of just applied that it's all legacy on the fields. There's, there's going to be legacy in the streams. And we're looking at that now, right? When we have these heavy storm events, it's not just the phosphorus and the sediments coming off the, the farm fields. It's coming from in stream. And so we have two projects right now that are funded in that space to figure out what's going on there. The other thing that I found from this, and this is early studies, so don't walk out of here saying, you know, but we have seen that that sediment running off not only does it provide phosphorus, but in instances, it actually absorbs that phosphorus. So during certain times of the year, the, the, the runoff, the sediment from the field might actually be drawing down some of the phosphorus that would be available to the algae. So we're looking at that. What do the sediments do as far as phosphorus release or absorption during low flow, during high flow? Is it in certain parts of the states that those sediments have different characteristics that they release it more than they absorb it? So all that work's going on now, but we have historically treated our rivers as pipes. Oh yeah, it comes from the ag field and then the rivers just take it to the lake where the problem is. That is not the case. And so we're working in that space now to figure out what contribution of phosphorus. And as far as legacy from fields, I'm not the expert in this space. I'm actually trained as a fish squeezer. I don't know how I got where I am now. Um, so in that legacy space, it's not like a farmer has 300 acres of legacy. I bet you it's 30 acres of 300 or 10 acres of 300, right? And so that's the biggest problem is we know the legacy is a big contributor as some of the data is suggesting it is, but addressing that problem, number one, finding the field is not easy. And then the technology to deploy to address legacies, I would argue is as expensive, if not more expensive than the things we're asking to do under four hours. So it's a, it's a tricky situation. Glenn, you can shake me down whenever you want. Please here and then back there. Yep, we do. And uh, I might even have the slide still in here. My old advisor would be so pr proud of me for keeping a slide to anticipate a question. Isn't that crazy? Here it is. All right. A little outdated because I haven't gotten this question in a long time. 2011, 2012, 2013. So that's the year. This is the metric tons of total phosphorus. So it's not dissolved versus particulate. This is total phosphorus. So the Detroit River, right? The Maumee and other tribs. Now let's take this and average of these, okay? So this is the average of these three years. So 47%, 41%, clearly. Maumee has 47%, Detroit 41. Here's the difference. Here is the flow, right? The Detroit is in that 95% and the Maumee is only 4%. So when you think about growing algae, they don't think about how much phosphorus I'm gonna see over a year. Is the concentration in the water at a given point in time enough to sustain my growth? And the problem is, is what you're doing is let's call this a packet of sugar and this a packet of sugar. If you dissolve this packet of sugar in this pot or urn of coffee, the concentration isn't where it needs to be. If you dissolve this in this, there's your concentration. Okay. So the phosphorus is coming in equivalent or, or more than, or actually a little bit less than the Maumee River. The problem is, is when it's coming in, it's dilute and there's not enough to drive these blooms. It's augmenting the blooms that ain't driving them. And you'll see when the blooms show up, it comes out of the Maumee River. And if there's no rain events or heavy things coming out of Detroit, it'll kind of work through the middle of the lake and then kind of move its way. But usually what happens, the mommy comes down, belches out, and it gets pushed down along the South Shore and just kind of hangs on. So 
So you, so you're, you know, what it is is basically we got to get this. This is too much of a phosphorus relative to the volume of water. That's what we got to do. We got to lower, got to lower phosphorus coming out of the moment. Yep. But is that easier from the flow? You guys looked at that and said, if we're going to get rid of the phosphorus out of Maumee, Good. So the question is, so what you're saying is actually, if we get more water, are we going to dilute the phosphorus that we have in the, in the mommy is what it was, I think what I'm here. Maybe let's talk about this because I'm, I need there's another question. Let's come offline on this one here. And then back there, do you still have a question here? Yeah. Wetlands. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, what's going on. <laughs> So this is what I love about uh, the director DNR, um, Director Mertz. So Director Mertz has money in H2 Ohio to construct wetlands. So someone's going to ag for practices and I keep calling them best practices and I hate that because not one is the best, right? They're management practices. But if we look at wetlands, money is being invested. There's about 88 wetlands that are either contracted or built or being built, right? She came and says, I know that not every wetland is going to be a phosphorus sink. Not all of them are going to draw it down. And some are eventually going to become sources. So what she's allocated is money to a group called LEARN. LEARN is the Lake Erie and Aquatic Research Network. So Sea Grant went around and grabbed all the academics from the 14 four-year institutions and some of the smaller non-state universities. And collectively, we have built a wetland monitoring plan. It's been in place since about 2021 is when we started taking samples. So our goal is to go out there and measure what phosphorus coming in and the phosphorus leaving, but also to measure what plants are growing there because some plants are going to draw phosphorus better than others. We're assessing the soil type. So is it a xeric soil that, that absorbs better than others? So our goal is to go back to Director Mertz and the DNR and say, if you're going to build a wetland, don't, don't do it like this one <laughs> or, or don't do it in this area because it didn't do what you wanted it to do. Do it like this. So the goal is we can't sit on our hands and wait. So the wetlands are going in, and I think there's going to be a lot of benefit from those. But the goal is after three or four or five years is to be able to feed the DNR back information that says we've learned lessons from wetland construction, and this is the way you need you need to go. Yes, I can come to you. Sorry. Oh, microphone. Yeah, it seems like a. Seems like phosphorus is a focal point here for the Lake Erie, you know, the algae bloom. But you also mentioned an introduction part, the nitrogen is, you know, equally contribute, you know, and also may cause more toxic algae. So do you have any research or plan to really specify what are the contributor of nitrogen, you know, program related? Yes, so the, so the question, as you heard, you had the microphone, it, um, Nitrogen is a tricky one, right? Phosphorus forms are a little easier to track. With nitrogen, you have nitrate, nitrite, ammonium, ure urea, so it's, it's all over the place. And so tracking nitrogen is a, is a heavier ask. Now, a lot of our best practices or management practices address both, but there are exceptions. Like we've been seeing with cover crops, typically they do a better job of drawing down the nitrogen species than they do the phosphorus species. So my goal here is, is we are, I don't think I've ever funded a project where they say we're gonna water, we're gonna measure the water coming off of this project and they're not measuring both phosphorus and nitrogen. So we have that data. Unfortunately, I'm a little biased in this one that I put phosphorus out in front. Nitrogen is just a trickier beast to track. Um, we do know it grows more or it allows the cyanobacteria to produce more toxins than if you didn't have the nitrogen concentration. The other thing is you're here for Lake Erie. A third of Ohio drains into Lake Erie. Two thirds goes to the Ohio River and the Ohio River gets in the Mississippi and the Mississippi goes to the Gulf. In our freshwater systems, they are typically phosphorus limited and our marine systems are actually nitrogen limited. So that nitrogen running off in the fields in the southern part of the state that get into the Ohio River are actually causing the cyanobacteria version that they have in the Gulf and their dead zone in the Gulf because of nitrogen. So it always needs to be through that dual lens of nitrogen and phosphorus. Probably gonna have to shut you off, Chris. It's good, I'm getting sore throat. Thank you, Chris. I have a couple of thoughts from Chris. One is it's neat to see the enthusiasm and the interest that he displays in his job, trying to do it. And secondly, it's such a complicated thing. Um, most people from the outside think, well, geez, if we do this, that'll fix everything in, in one fell swoop. You know, we get approached from time to time from people who think, well, if we get rid of livestock, that'll fix the lake immediately. Um, just there is not a simple solution to it, but we can all work toward a general 
uh, general resolution. And I think that's really what it takes. It takes a lot of research, it's gonna take a lot of time. 